Assalamu alaikum and welcome once again to Beyond the Surface. Today we will be continuing our discussion on Gaza, how the West is supporting Israel. And like we were joined last time, we will be joined once again by Mr. Charles Shoebridge, who is a writer, broadcaster and independent authority on issues related to security, intelligence, terrorism and crime. Mr. Shoebridge is a graduate of history and politics and of the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, where he served for almost two decades in diverse frontline policing and military roles, specializing in counterterrorism and intelligence operations. Prior to his service at Scotland Yard and elsewhere, he has worked in counterterrorism as a commissioned officer in the British Army. Thank you very much, Mr. Shoebridge, for joining us again today. If we get back into now why why this is happening, I mean, why the support of the West, and again, we are talking of the media and the leadership, because just like you clarified, I think uh, London, for example, has been um, a ground where a lot of freedom movements have come up. South Africa is an example, and definitely um, at the moment, people protesting in London um, have got larger groups of people in London than in the Muslim countries, people near uh, Palestine. <coughs> so there is obviously very clear distinction and we'll discuss that too. But why the governments, why the media, this support for Israel, why? One has to look at um, uh, not so much necessarily what governments say, but what uh, the way that they act and then uh, judge why they're acting in this way. Um, now, governments will say that they are acting, and all governments are like this, of course, that they act in the national interests of their countries. But really we should say the perceived nat national interests of their countries because, for example, uh, let's take a wider perspective here because it's still relevant to the Israel situation or the Gaza situation. That, for example, in Syria, where we've had a situation where um, the West has um, uh, taken action that um, in supporting, for example, Syria's rebels against Assad. They're now in a position where they're now having just announced whether they do it or not is another matter, but where they've just announced that they're going to the, so the US um, uh, authorised airstrikes against ISIS. Um, in Syria, it's the enemy, supposedly, of the West, Assad, um, who is fighting ISIS with airstrikes, um, although you won't see much reference of that, of course, in our, in our newspapers. And so therefore, you have to look back further. The West says, in this example, in this example that is supporting Syria's rebels because um, Assad is a dictator and because uh, and therefore uh, we need to support the rebels who presumably therefore are some form of secular democrats. But of course there's ve been very little evidence from the outset for those who've actually looked at the situation and now I think it's much more widely accepted even in the mainstream media because it's undeniable that for the majority of people uh, fighting the Assad regime um, are almost certainly not democratically uh, oriented and they're not secular. Um, which then of course begs the question, so in fact, what was the reason that we were supporting them? And that's where you need to say, look at, well, hang on, who else is supporting them? And that's where the so-called national interest comes to play. So for example, if we look at countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar at the time, were supporting uh, Syria's rebels. These are extremely powerful countries financially in respect of countries such as the United Kingdom and the United States. They fund extremely powerful lobbies who fund to some extent, but certainly influence politicians, media um, managers, and so on, opinion formers. Clearly Saudi Arabia, for example, in Syria is not interested in, in some Sunni democracy. Uh, it would threaten its own uh, uh, you know, authoritarian state. Um, and so th therefore there must be other reasons. And so for example, we can look at a broader geopolitical issue, uh, picture. And we can say that, well, of course, Saudi Arabia, it sees its main rival, uh, not as Israel, but as um, Iran. And so of course, Syria was an ally of Iran. And then suddenly it all begins to make much more sense. Oh, this is the reason we're really backing these, these, um, uh, these uh, people on the ground uh, that eventually spawned ISIS, of course, um, and others. So then if we apply this also to the Israeli-Palestinian situation, um, we need to look firstly at what the politicians and the media say, that Israel has a right to self-defense, that um, uh, Hamas are doing this, Hamas are using human shields, Hamas are lots and lots of claims like this. Um, but the thing to do is to step back and say, where is this broader geopolitical interest lie? And this is why I say that it's important to distinguish between interests and perceived interests, because 
it has, it has turned out, for example, going back to the Syrian example, that it, it wasn't in our interest to back these people. Yes, we assumed, our governments assumed, it was in our interest to back them because this was doing what Saudi Arabia and Qatar, very powerful economic players, wanted us to do. And, and yet it's turned out not to be in our interest. In other words, the West's interests don't have to be tied to the interests of other countries such as Saudi Arabia and Qatar. I think, over a period of time, the same realisation, if one is an optimist, optimist, will dawn on policymakers in respect of Israel. At the moment, there is a mindset that says that if certain states want things and, uh, and, and desire things, then it's in our interest to want them too. Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Israel. These are countries which dominate and shape the West's foreign policy. But there have been signs recently that particularly when personalities such as Obama, who has been much criticised, and rightly so for many um, uh, reasons, is in respect to foreign policy. But nonetheless, he has shown signs of independent thought, of thought that takes American uh, strategy away from what it's traditionally been. And that's particularly, of course, we've seen that in respect of the um, Iranian nuclear deals and the lifting of sanctions to some degree against Iran. Israel fought tooth and nail in the public domain as well to stop uh, that process from taking place and they failed and it was became increasingly clear that when you listen to the words of Netanyahu and others and of the US uh, Israeli lobby that far more than fearing a nuclear armed Iran really what Israel feared was a rapprochement between a coming together if you like of Iran its enemy and the West um, for example Here's an example now in Iraq against ISIS. And so this is, this is Israel's fear. And so Israel is pushing the agenda, of course, of itself as a democratic, progressive state, notwithstanding its actions that it's taken. So, but we've still got this issue that the perceived interests of the West lie with Israel. And of course, this is founded upon what is widely uh, pushed to be uh, as so-called common values. But then when we see the bombing of Gaza, and what's happened, where is the commonality of values? Okay, a cynic can say, yeah, but Britain and America has done that in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's true to some extent, but it's not the same as what's been happening in Gaza. You know, Britain, for example, had terrorism, as it called it, from the IRA. And some of that came from across the border in the, so the south of, of Ireland for thir uh, 30 years, for three decades. You know, 3,000 people died in the UK uh, as a result of terrorism uh, on all sides uh, from the IRA. But there wasn't a single airstrike was carried out. There was never a use of artillery or multiple rocket launchers or tanks against these people. Now, I know that's a crude analogy, but it still illustrates that, you know, notwithstanding what Britain and America have done to other countries, and they stand widely criticised for that, it doesn't compare, you know, to the same degree as what's happened in Gaza over the last few weeks. So when we go back to the central question, or the question you just asked, we need therefore to look at um, perhaps financial matters behind the scenes as to why uh, the West or its governments are so supportive of Israel. First of all, there is this aspect of taking away the finance, this idea about common values, about democracy, uh, etc., etc. And it's a sophisticated modern country, Israel, for sure, uh, despite its, uh, its, its issues, uh, even if that is largely funded on foreign aid. But secondly, there's no doubt that the Israel lobby in capitals um, uh, around the Western world is unbelievably powerful. When one looks, for example, at, uh, let's say, uh, the UK government, 80% of uh, this survey was carried out in 2012. Patrick Coburn, the journalist, wrote an article that really exposed um, all of this. That um, I'm going to go back on that. Let me go back on that. You can take that out. What I was going to say is so, can I just because I want to take Patrick Coburn's name out just in case it wasn't him? I think it was. It's absolutely clear that Israel uh, has an extremely powerful lobby. I mean, this is well known. But it's, it's really undeniable when one looks at um, the situation in Washington and, for example, in London. As an example, uh, in 2012, uh, it, 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 which is the last figures that I saw, that uh, just two years ago, that 80% of the UK government's MPs were members of the Conservative Friends of Israel. 
I mean, there is no other lobby group that has this kind of, of power. Um, so you've got a situation where, um, the, you know, the, the, they can exert influence that goes well beyond their economic power as a state, that goes well beyond their uh, economic or military or, or political importance to the West, uh, but, but nonetheless drives policy towards Israel. And we've seen that very, very clearly that notwithstanding the vast or well not vast, but growing public pressure in, th in, in the West against what's been happening in Israel, that Britain's government has pretty much, apart from one or two exceptions, really stood firm with Israel, even though that has gone against uh, public opinion. And that tells you the strength of that lobby. But talking about the lobby, I mean, this is just a refined uh, term, really, to describe corruption in another manner. Because if something similar happened to, say, in a continent like Africa, where a certain group of people were influencing uh, politicians to make certain by contributing, say, towards their election um, campaign or whatever, we would straight away say this is corruption and that African leaders are corrupt. Is this not corruption? Well, lobbying is a form of corruption. I mean, um, because at the end of the day, um, uh, people are using their influence or perhaps uh, financial incentives, whether it's uh, gifts to um, uh, parties, funding election campaigns, or perhaps more discreet ways of, of funding to, um, uh, to achieve a political aim. And this isn't, of course, just in the international arena. When one looks in America, for example, the power of uh, people like the, uh, the gun lobby or, or, or others, um, one can see that um, they wield a disproportionate power uh, largely through funding of, of, of politicians. And of course, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a form of corruption. It needs to be, of course, made fully open. Um, people can give donations to, to parties and so on. I mean, obviously, it's a, it, we're entering into a, 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 a complex area um, that we could discuss for hours by itself, whether, you know, the, whether it's um, uh, subversive or undermining of democracy, for example, that lobbying can even take place because, of course, it, it increases the uh, power and influence of individuals or corporations um, uh, purely on the basis of their financial strength as opposed to the numbers of voters they represent. At the end of the day, they, corporations and wealthy individuals are not representative bodies, and yet they wield enormous um, uh, power. That's been the case always, and, and, and it certainly is now. And we can certainly see that in the case of um, uh, the Saudi lobby, the Qatari lobby, the um, Israeli lobby, these are all powerful bodies simply because they, as in many cases, as, as wealthy individuals who are effectively advocates or protagonists for states such as Israel, they own so much in the way of financial resources that they can then influence and sway governments. Um, but the problem comes when, um, uh, or the, if, if you like, the opportunity comes depending on your perspective, when the viewpoint of those who are doing that lobbying, uh, which is basically just to support Israel, that's, that's their viewpoint, um, can then be combined with, uh, of course, uh, and this is where PR people and so on will get involved and where the media becomes so useful with abstract um, uh, ideas such as, uh, well, Israel is a democracy. Um, and then, of course, uh, all of the terminology starts being put in because, for example, you'll see Hamas are consistently described um, as militants in the West media, in the same way that, for example, anybody that is an, a so-called enemy of the West is called a militant. The East Ukrainian um, uh, rebels are called militants. Uh, uh, what makes them militant is it's hard to see. But um, if you're called militants, clearly, uh, and Syria rebels, for example, very rarely called militants. Uh, ISIS, when they're on the Iraq side of the border, they're called militants. And so we can see here that the uh, combination of all these different players can then produce this narrative, which is, if not pro-Israel, although it is pro-Israel, but of course that narrative has become increasingly difficult to sustain because of what's obviously been going in Gaza. And then of course it shifts to be explanatory, to uh, purport to explain Israel's actions, that Israel has no choice but to kill so many civilians. And we've seen all that in, in the West media over the last um, a few weeks. And then of course it becomes self-reinforcing as part of the lobby, because then you'll get the uh, mainstream population uh, to a large degree also supporting um, what Israel's doing, because of course they have a very uh, narrow view of what's been going on because they're still to a large degree, although this is changing because of social media, Twitter and so on, peoples in the West are still largely dependent upon the narrative of their mainstream media. And of course if that mainstream media is uh, 
if not controlled, but then largely influenced by the lobby groups, then it becomes almost for the lobbyists a self-perpetuating virtuous circle. Because not only is the lobby directly seeking to influence politicians and governments, but also then there is this perceived upwards pressure that comes from the people because of the messages they've been being fed. An encouraging aspect of this, which has changed so much over the last only very few years, is because of the advent of social media, such as Twitter, people, particularly in the West, have an alternative source for their news or an alternative source for opinions, which means in turn, not only can they actually switch away from the mainstream media that is sending this one-sided narrative, but also it means that the mainstream media itself cannot anymore ignore, to the same degree as it perhaps once would, things that are inconvenient to its uh, mainstream narrative. Because if they are going to keep any credibility at all, they cannot ignore things that are on Twitter, for example, or are appearing in other news sources, uh, let's say about Ukraine, for example, Russia Today, which again is, puts an alternative uh, narrative. Um, one cannot know any more ignore the other because otherwise its credibility would be totally destroyed. Um, and so therefore, Twitter social media is having a very big impact. And so an aspect for the future is that social media in that bottom up respect of, in, of, of influence in politicians, which after all is what democracy is supposed to be about, that actually, um, if you like, the chain of um, self-reinforcement between lobbyists and then upward pressure coming from the ground to support that lobby um, uh, may in the future be more difficult to sustain. Um, we were discussing the West's support for um, Israel and the lobbying that goes on here because of which the West has been supporting. Do you think that things are changing now in terms of the ordinary people after this uh, Gaza war that has happened? Do you see that ordinary people, say, on the streets of London are changing their opinions? I think um, uh, the explosion of social media over the last maybe only four or five years, because one can look back to events in 2009 with Israel and killing civilians, and one can see the response here, uh, certainly in London, uh, amongst ordinary people and that has to then be reflected in the media, uh, the mainstream media, um, has changed. And, and one can, I think, ascribe that to the growth of social media. Because what's happening is that people now are having an alternative uh, viewpoint. People are able to access alternative news from, uh, you know, from channels around the world. Uh, people are tweeting things um, uh, that bring in, uh, bring in people's attention to uh, items or news or facts which wouldn't have been reported or at least wouldn't have given, been given much prominence in the mainstream media of the West, because the mainstream media of the West, no matter how diverse or pluralistic it might be, and this is very arguable, of course, in terms of um, its domestic output or commenting on domestic issues, internationally, mainstream media tends to be uh, a mouthpiece of its, um, of its host government. So, and it doesn't really mean that uh, just the BBC is a mouthpiece of the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, if you look at uh, any of the mainstream news organisations, print or broadcast, uh, almost invariably, and I, 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 therefore I don't say it's all the case, but almost invariably, on most major foreign policy issues, they will take the UK government line. And the UK government line is the US government line. And so um, uh, that has always been the case. But because of this growth of social media and because of this provision of an alternative and because that can challenge the uh, narrative that's been set, that isn't just meaning that some people or many people now increasingly, because somebody will see something on Twitter, they will discuss that with their mates in a cafe or a pub or something like this. Um, they will discuss it with their work colleagues. So the number of people on Twitter isn't necessarily indicative of its increasing influence, because on top of that are people who aren't on this social media who are still talking by traditional means. And of course, it's not, uh, the subject is going to be something like, um, oh, did you see that on the TV? And then somebody's going to say nowadays, which they wouldn't have said five years ago, oh yeah, but I saw something different, which was on Twitter, or it was on from some Arabic channel, or it was from some Russian channel, or Iranian channel, or something like this, or Australian, or some alternative channel that's in the UK that wouldn't ever have been uh, heard of before. And so all of this is now becoming available. And then because it's then available on social media, it means the mainstream media also has to at least mention it somehow. Because otherwise uh, people can then point to them and go, there, that's the proof you're biased. Because otherwise you would have mentioned this or you didn't mention uh, something. And so that is having a great impact 
an increasing impact on public opinion. I'm going to go outside the uh, Israel situation um, momentarily to prove how this can hold uh, potential for the future in respect not just of Israel but many, many other issues, particularly foreign policy issues. When um, uh, Assad allegedly uh, used nerve agent um, uh, against uh, civilians supposedly in Damascus last August, I think it was. The mainstream media on the whole in the UK and the US was overwhelmingly supportive of the UK and US government position, which was that uh, this so-called red line of Obama's had been crossed and this was now the time to strike Assad. Now, if we remember, what happened was that opinion polls were showing in the UK and the US that around 70 to 80 percent of people did not want us to attack Syria. Um, and uh, they either A, they didn't believe what they were being told, or B, they're fed up with war or a combination of different things. Now, this is an extraordinary turn of events because in the past, the only source of information and indeed opinions of people, particularly in the United States, it must be said, is from their mainstream media. And yet, their opinion, public opinion, was completely opposed to that. So the messages must be coming from somewhere else. Hence, the social media explosion, I think, is, is accountable for that, or at least largely accountable for, to explain this. And then, of course, then what happened because of that upward pressure, that then resulted in British members of parliament voting against their own government. And actually, then that attack on Syria wasn't uh, supported by Britain. And that left America isolated, albeit with France at the time. And that, without any doubt, well, then there was pressure in the US to have a similar vote, which, of course, um, uh, was a nice excuse for Obama uh, if you needed one, to then not attack. So this is a great example of where the powers of lobbies, the power of, because the Israeli, Saudi, Qatari lobbies, these powerful lobbies, were really lobbying hard for that attack on Assad to take place. The media was supporting it, the governments were supporting it in the UK and US, but it didn't happen. We can see signs of that now with this Israeli-Gaza situation as well. Because of what's being shown, shown on social media, the West media is being forced, the mainstream media, to show these horrendous images of what's been going on in Gaza, the suffering on the ground. And it's inescapable that people will come to the conclusion, this is wrong. And that's particularly when, for example, in the last three years, the same mainstream media has been showing similar images of what it says is happening in Syria and combining that with condemnation of the alleged perpetrator, which they've said is Assad. Of course, there was a civil war there and both sides are killing civilians, as happens in a war. Um, and yet when they've been showing similar images of what's been happening in Gaza, it hasn't been accompanied by this media and government condemnation. People, at the end of the day, can see that there is inconsistency here. There is hypocrisy here. And people are becoming increasingly angry about that, particularly when it's then revealed that the UK and the US their governments, their taxes, if you like, to some degree, are being used in the US case to actually pay for this slaughter. And people are wondering, is this actually what we want? So people are demonstrating, but more than that, on social media and letters and emails to their MPs and so on, their representatives, they are complaining about it. So I think with the growth of social media, if this growth continues, if it continues to be largely unregulated and largely independent, in other words, it isn't bought by, uh, for example, Twitter isn't bought by Saudi uh, shareholders or Israeli shareholders uh, who then want to pursue their own agenda. If it can remain free and independent, this offers great hope, I think, for the future that the power of these lobbies can be, it's not going to be eradicated totally, but that it can be subverted and it can be reduced. And then people can start thinking, well, what actually is truly in our national interest? And also, hopefully, combined with that, what is actually the right thing to do? And that isn't really what's been happening um, with Israel and with a whole host of other foreign policy issues. Uh, a similar change, we see signs of it in the leadership. For example, we've seen the resignation of Lady Warsi. Um, we have seen some comments now coming from Ed Miliband, also coming from Nick Clegg. Do you think that these are genuine or is this again um, just trying to be opportunistic and uh, there's election next year? Um, politicians uh, it may sound cynical, but you know, I think I'm reflecting certainly an overwhelmingly majority view if I say that um, politicians are, are naturally uh, opportunistic. Um, it, it, one could argue that it, in many ways it's been slightly um, 
disturbing or distasteful, should we say, to see the leaders of the West um, now, uh, of course it's a welcome message, but nonetheless it's still slightly distasteful to see and hear leaders of the West now expressing concern about civilian casualties, um, whereas for three weeks they sat on their hands and kept quiet, or even worse, the same people supported Israel uh, in what they're doing. I mean, for example, um, uh, uh, they've, if we look at the UK government position, David Cameron, UK Prime Minister, is now, because of this pressure from the politicians that you mentioned, who themselves have been pressured by their populations and their constituencies, Cameron's message now is, no, we have consistently called for a ceasefire. This is untrue. When one looks at, and again, it's all there on social media because and it can't be changed now, when one looks at the written statements of, um, of, of, of what British politicians said, of what the British government's position was, it was entirely condemnatory of Hamas, entirely supportive, entirely unreservedly supportive of uh, the Israeli government bombardment that was already taking place and already killing, even at that time, tens and tens of civilians. Naturally, it's become hundreds and thousands since then. So it's... Uh, you know, the government cannot claim that that was its consistent position was the ceasefire. It wasn't. It supported Israeli action. But we do still see, which is a ground for optimism, that politicians again, albeit opposition position, uh, politicians and some conservatives too in the UK, have been forced to come out publicly because of the public pressure that is coming from underneath. And that pressure is being created by and of course facilitated by social media because then of course it also then has to be reflected in the mainstream media as well and it's at that point that when the politicians then think okay uh, I can see the direction of travel of this and eventually it's, um, it's going to be totally condemning of Israel. I want to be one of the first, says a politician, to actually join that bandwagon. Yeah. We've, seen, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, support uh, as we discussed uh, through the ordinary people. This is through the social media, it might be through the protest or even uh, sanctions that people have started against the Israel. Um, and in Western capitals really this support is stronger than even from Arab countries and Muslim countries. Do you think a change can really come from these kind of uh, lobbying in a different context obviously? Um, will this influence for example the elections next year? Is there enough voting power with these ordinary people in Western capitals to influence change? Well, it's a very good question because uh, uh, if, if these were true democracies, of course, um, the Western countries that had true democracies, then of course the uh, feelings of ordinary people would count, but, um, and to a large degree they do, to be, to be honest. But, but if the choices, uh, voting choices are limited, then of course you have a limitation of democracy itself. If one looks at, let's take the UK example, and the US example is even more so, um, there is choice and a democratic choice. You can choose at election time, of course, uh, between different parties. But if those parties have exactly the same policy, for example, um, foreign policy, where is this democratic choice? I think in the UK, um, there is a, a, a new situation that has arisen, and this applies also to some other countries. And I think there is a feeling that uh, a similar situation may at some future point arise even in the US. And that is in the UK, for example, you've got three main parties. Uh, two of which are uh, now, uh, of course, in power as a coalition. Their foreign policy positions have been almost identical on almost all foreign policy matters. For example, the Liberal Democrats, even though they opposed the war on Iraq, as soon as the war happened, they then supported it. Um, and then uh, having then, you know, they were in opposition then. And of course, they've now shown their true colours because now they're in government, they've supported uh, attacks on Libya, they've also then supported uh, the attack on Syria, which, which didn't take place. So I think there is a general uh, uh, disillusionment, shall we say, amongst British public about, um, about uh, these kind of issues anyway, um, because governments have gone to the, uh, taken these, these uh, military actions, uh, largely without the support of the people in any case. Whatever one thinks of a new player on the block in the UK, which is UKIP, um, UKIP is the first party, and this do not, you know, one should not take this as an advocacy of UKIP, um, I'm just stating it as a factual um, uh, observation. Now in the UK we have a uh, party called UKIP which is the first time, because UKIP is now doing really well on the polls, their foreign policy position is entirely different from the other three parties. Uh, they advocate uh, pretty much a non-interventionist role. Um, it could well be that the mainstream political parties, excluding UKIP, 
of course they are running scared of UKIP at the elections, particularly in certain key uh, constituencies. Now, the media comment that they are running scared of UKIP because of uh, issues such as immigration, crime, uh, the EU, of course, membership. But also it could well be that with this growing um, uh, lack of appetite for West's intervention in uh, the affairs of other countries, particularly military adventures, and particularly support for organisations or countries such as Saudi Arabia, Israel, that are acting in such uh, reprehensible ways, as Lady Wazi called it, that this could also uh, encourage a move away from uh, people voting for the mainstream parties because now they have an alternative. Alternatively, they may worry that people are just not going to vote at all, which of course delegitimizes the government in terms of reduced turnout. And so I think there is this worry in respect of this. And if there wasn't this worry, it's very difficult to explain why, having first supported Israel's actions, after three weeks, many pol or kept quiet about it, after three weeks, Politicians then started saying, actually, um, Israel is acting uh, quite poorly here, even though their actions were the same as they were three weeks before. And it's also difficult to understand why, going back to the Syrian example, why MPs were so against attacking Syria when their government and the media and in their own pronouncements beforehand had been very much in favour of it. It must be because they fear public pressure. And the only reason that they can fear public pressure is because they fear what the result will be at the ballot box when an election comes. And so therefore I think social media in this respect, by providing this alternative narrative, by holding the mainstream media to account, by providing an alternative uh, source of facts as well as opinions and perspectives to the public, is enhancing democracy in an enormous way. Uh, it's a different subject, but by means of this mechanism, I think increasingly the publics of countries, and I include in the United States where of course social media is very strong, increasingly the publics of these countries are being are able to hold their governments to account over an area of policy, particularly foreign policy, where in the past, because of the lack of choice amongst parties, they've not really had a true choice. They've not been able to go to um, uh, uh, an election and say we're voting for this particular policy or against this policy because all the parties have had the same policy. And it's also now that whereas in the past foreign policy perhaps wasn't uppermost at all in people's minds when they go to the uh, polls on election day, it's of economics and stuff like this, when you see such uh, visual representations as we've seen of the suffering that is being caused not just abstractly in the world but by countries such as Israel, that we are absolutely supporting, or our politicians are, it's then the public may well decide to hold those politicians who have supported those actions and that killing to account. And I think whether that happens or not, it's a fear that politicians increasingly are having. And so the short answer, because that was a long answer, but the short answer is very much yes. With the growth of social media, politicians quite rightly in the West are fearing more and more their constituencies and are fearing that they are going to be held to account over matters that traditionally they haven't been held to account over foreign policy. And so yes, I think over time the power of the lobbies will be reduced until of course the lobbies or their, um, uh, the people that they advocate for uh, gradually, as I'm sure they will, take control of the social media networks. Mr Charles Shoebridge, thank you so much for joining us today. That's a pleasure. Thanks for having me.